what people understand by safety, how they understand messages about safety, and how they understand the risks they face is not absolute. It's determined by the culture, the common set of values, beliefs, attitudes and working practices that determine people's behaviours. This collection is what we call the safety culture and can be distinguished into a number of different cultures that are increasingly better in terms of the safety culture ladder from pathological through calculative to generative. In my previous talk I discussed how we can become a better safety culture, moving up the ladder towards the proactive and even generative cultures. I mentioned leadership in passing as essential if you want to move up the ladder, while a lack of leadership is one of the best ways to slip down. I've come to realise that safety leadership, at least its content rather than its style, can be framed in terms of going one step higher than those around you. So if the culture is reactive, then leadership involves setting out a calculative vision and behaving in ways that make that come about. If the culture is already calculative, then the leader has to be dragging everyone else up towards the proactive stage. And if the culture is still predominantly pathological, and many unfortunately are, then reactive is where you have to be. Shooting for proactive is doomed to fail. No one will understand what you say, and they lack the skills to build on. An example of early safety leadership, one simple enough for the organisational safety culture of the time, 1984, was given by a member of Shell's Committee of Managing Directors. Simply, he said, we are killing too many people, and instituted a reactive process, kept up to this day, whereby his top colleagues personally reviewed every fatal accident with the top manager of the country where the accident happened. This instituted a company-wide habit of reacting seriously to accidents, no longer accepting them as the price of doing business. Another example of the same transition, when much of the company, indeed the industry at the time, was pretty pathological or early reactive, was Dick, then production director for a major oil and gas company for the whole North Sea. Normally such a person would have a stack of reports on his desk, which were then delegated for processing, even someone professing to be as passionate about safety as Dick was. Not him. He had the cleanest desk you ever saw. He was hard to meet in his office, as he was always offshore. People knew he was coming and lined up to tell him about problems and issues that he did his best to have fixed before he flew back on the last flight when I could meet him in his office. He showed the problems were worth identifying and would get fixed. By responding directly to workforce concerns, Dick moved safety reporting way up the agenda, creating trust by actually taking reports seriously. Nowadays, these examples might not be regarded as particularly unusual, but at the time they formed powerful messages appropriate for what people could understand given their culture at the time. Articulating a more advanced vision would frankly have gone over people's heads and been a waste of time, making for fine speeches but little if any impact. Safety leadership is also not just repeating the message of the day, knowing what the script is, because that will never be enough to shift people, the culture, towards a better place. Two people I've both known well, again in the same old company, I'll call them Coase and Richard, who showed safety leadership by first devising and then implementing safety management systems. Coase, although an engineer, felt that the next step in safety management had to take account of the people and hired a group of us, including myself and Jim Reason, even before the Piper Alpha disaster. This led to Swiss cheese as well as SMS that was still in the same department. Coase was, and still is, unremittingly focused on HSE and made sure that his top management knew what was going on. He left them with a clear understanding that this was where the company was going and they had to be part of it. They, in turn, supported him and left him as group head of upstream HSE to get the job done. What we all put in place was essentially early calculative, an approach to safety that transcended responding to the immediate events but started to look at the underlying factors and collect data. Richard was his successor and he took up the next task, getting the system into operation worldwide, whether required by regulators or not. This involved managing the transition from in place to in operation. Many of your problems arose from locations where they frankly didn't wish to change their ways, but again, with the support of even more senior managers, he got it done. 
Moving from design to operation is not always straightforward, and when our clever ideas on safety management didn't work as expected, he yet again showed leadership by giving us the possibility to go over and get things right. At the time, their boss, an Australian I'll call Rob, showed his leadership by backing them up even though it meant he had to change his own habits and show publicly he truly believed in safety. Crucial to all these individuals was their emphasis on reaching out to all levels. I remember a safety conference in Melbourne where Rob and I shared a dinner table with an aviation refueler from Sydney who could hardly believe his ears when Rob was showing his workforce members where he wanted them to go next and start doing it themselves proactively as senior management started to take a step back out of the limelight. This was exactly what my next example did. Michael Abrashoff was not the brightest and the best in the US Navy. He graduated from Naval College in the bottom half and when he got command of a destroyer, he didn't get the best, he got the worst, the USS Benfold. Re-enlistment on the Benfold was 0%. Presumably the crew hated the ship and the Navy. Mike Abrashoff selected re-enlistment rate as his measure of success and started to create what we now recognise as a proactive culture, building on and past the calculative culture that is the US Navy. He documented his efforts and how successful he was in a book called It's Your Ship, with the following set of chapter titles that reads almost like a description of the proactive culture for leaders. Take command. Lead by example. Listen aggressively, one of my favourites. Communicate purpose and meaning. Create a climate of trust. Look for results, not salutes. Effective, not just operational. Take calculated risks. Go beyond standard procedures. Effectiveness again. Build up your people. This is where you have to give power back. Generate unity. The move from I to we. Improve your people's quality of life. Mike made his crew members work to make themselves better and then recognised their successes in public. One thing he did to win the trust of his crew members was to insist that the ship bought its food supplies from better suppliers rather than take the easy way out and accept what they were normally given. This both saved the US Navy a lot of money and led to a well-nourished crew for a change. He only had one autocratic demand. No country music when they parted in harbour. This kind of non-standard thinking is related to both engendering trust, but also in moving processes and procedures and making them effective. Not merely requiring strict compliance, but making things work. Reenlistment shot up to nearly 100%. His crew's competence scores became stellar, but he discovered that he had missed one vital component. He never communicated what and why he was doing to his fleet peers who became jealous, leading to problems he documented in the second book, It's Our Ship. Another example I've worked with was Vice President of part of a major Southeast Asian airline maintenance company. He decided that his staff should go on a hazard hunt but they had to fix any problems they found as part of our programme to improve the safety culture. This is proactive behaviour where power and responsibility are beginning to be handed back from management to the workforce. One group identified a major risk, but they also knew it would be expensive to fix, so they held back. The VP and I went to look at what they'd found. We suggested some extra possibilities that reduced the price tag to only a million and a half dollars. Then he said, do it, and walked away. As far as he was concerned, it was cheap at the price. Finally, I was lucky enough to find a generative organisation, a coal mine of all things, and learn about how they got there. Yet again, safety leadership by the general manager, who I'll call Peter, involved Peter developing a vision of what a truly advanced safety and production culture might look like, and then driving the whole mine in that direction. The miners were not necessarily comfortable, at least to start with, as he devolved power over production planning, training and operations to the teams, stepping back over two years. One of his intentions was to deliberately counter the prevailing mining culture in which miners took out their brains and left them in a box at the start of the shift. He took away their boxes, metaphorically, to make them take responsibility for their actions and develop mutual trust. 
The result of this, and many other actions, was that the mine had both the best safety and production performance in the region and stayed open and profitable long after it was originally planned to be closed down. In all these cases, safety leadership appears to have involved the leader identifying and publicly pushing a vision that represented one step higher on the safety culture ladder than the organisation was at the time. The advantage of using this knowledge is that a safety leader can articulate for themselves a much more detailed vision of what they aspire to than just being safe or safety first. Anyone armed with a clear and more detailed vision, what, how and why, will find it much easier to communicate, to know how to behave, whatever their personal leadership style. These three, what we do, how we do it and why, differ at the different levels of the safety ladder, changing as we learn to get better in progress. Learning a style without this kind of substance doesn't really get you very far. In fact, if the vision being developed is of a really advanced generative culture, then this will only work for a culture that is already proactive because only then will what someone does and says make sense. I've said that everyone can be a safety leader because anyone can show their colleagues where to go next. Nevertheless, there is still a special role laid out for those higher up in the organisation, especially those right at the top, those like Rex Tillerson and unlike Tony Hayward. If those at the top do not develop their own vision and seek out and actively support those who share this below them, then no matter how much transformation the workforce might attempt, they will always be shot down if those at the top are not leading in the first place. The inverse, however, does not need apply. It's just harder for senior safety leaders to find ways of getting everyone on board with their vision, like Peter when he no longer allowed his miners to leave their brains in a box for their shifts. Senior safety leaders have to search out and publicly support those below them, right to the bottom, who are trying to be safety leaders as well. I've covered what the vision might consist of, an articulated view of what safety means for everyone on the next step of the ladder. I've also stressed the importance of communication because leadership is a public activity. Setting a personal example, showing integrity and developing trust also take a lot of effort. A simple tool I like to give people is the idea of a walk-talk ratio. Whenever someone is communicating a vision, how much are they backing it up with deeds as well as words? You can use this to rate your bosses, your colleagues, even your reports, although doing it to yourself is harder. Someone with a ratio of one is walking the talk. Someone a bit lower is probably pushing the talk and has to follow up. Someone with a low ratio is really full of hot air. I once met someone in Houston who I rated well above one because he was doing great things but was weak on the talk part, which is also so vital in leadership. This was Mike Abrashoff's lesson with his peers. A bit lower than one is probably where I would like people to be when that extra is where they want to get to and everyone else, which is what I've been equating with safety leadership. One may be fantastic, but is also easy to get when you don't push past the envelope of your own comfort zone. One last lesson I've learnt over the years. When we started out after Piper Alpha to define and implement the concept of a safety management system, we discovered that although you could generalise management systems to anything, such as environment, quality, occupational health, early efforts that did this fell flat. We realised that organisations have to start simply and then can generalise once they've acquired the managerial skills. Safety formed the point of the wedge as accidents are immediate, salient and hard to repair, unlike some of the rest. Leadership is often taught as if you can learn to be a leader and then apply it to safety. But the lesson applies here too. Learn to lead in one area, I suggest safety, and get the hang of it. Integrating safety culture and safety leadership gets us around the style-substance divide. Even if you're not too good on style, you can always be good on substance. And honestly, if you can't lead on safety, what can you lead?